Ah, heck, it's me, Thunkle Stunkle. And ah, gee whiz, ah, dang, everybody, I just plum don't know what to make a video about this week. I have to make a video every week, or else the curse that binds me to my material form will be lifted, and my bones will fall apart. You know what that means. I have to make a response video to some random reactionary. It's time to spin the wheel of reaction. Come on, come on, big money, big money, give me Caleb, give me Caleb, give fuck. Frig, it's Prager U, these guys. Prager University, for those of you that are outside of my teeny tiny media bubble and somehow don't know what it is, is a conservative propaganda mill masquerading as educational content, funded by petrobillionaires. It's not a real university, they just call themselves that. So I guess welcome to Thought Slimes Academy for Lumpy Lads. Why not? You can just call yourself anything. Although it's not actually educational content, it is shown in a depressing amount of schools. So that's something to be concerned about. They're well, albeit boringly, edited videos featuring some of the biggest names in douchebaggery. I think everyone on the wheel has done a PragerU video at some point, except Caleb? So far? PragerU has a very unique way of presenting an argument, which is to say that they don't. They do not. They just kind of say things as though they're uncontested, self-evident facts and move on. That's the kind of thing you can do when you pretend to be a university. It's the same reason I put the word thought in the title of my YouTube channel, to let people know that I'm a big smarty boy that you should take seriously with all of my good ideas and smart, smart brain. Everything about their videos gives the appearance of authority, from having their speakers dress up in suits and ties, to the meaningless infographics that flash on screen so quickly you don't have time to recognize they make no sense to the pseudo-celebrities that they have host. It all gives the impression that this is some serious thinking man's operation, something with real research and elbow grease put into it. And that's not to say that there's no work put in. Obviously there is. About as much work as, say, goes into one of my videos. So that's about how seriously you should take them. About as seriously as you take me. Anywho, the fish in a barrel we'll be shooting today is called Capitalism or Socialism? Which is more democratic? Hosted by convicted felon, but not in a cool way, in a boring way, Dinesh D'Souza. D'Souza once claimed that 9-11 was the product of the Islamic world's justified outrage at tolerance towards gay people and argued that they were right to be mad about that and therefore we should not allow gay people to be around so that there wouldn't be as much terrorism. Evidently, Dinesh is very proud of the argument he put forth in this video because the whole thing is just a dramatic reading of a Newsweek article he wrote five months earlier. Now it's just a five minute video, right? But PragerU's standard BSPM is four to five times as high as the average YouTube channel. So when we factor in that, there's the equivalent to 20 to 25 minute videos amount of bullshit. As you can see from the length of my response, I definitely found some stuff to talk about in there. See, Mr. D'Souza's got a problem. Those crummy socialists are up to no good, weaseling their way into politics once again. Why is socialism so popular? Less than 10 years ago, you couldn't refer to socialism in a positive way and hope to have a career in American politics. Socialism was referred to as the S word. Ah, uh, yes. The S word. Socialism. Socialism used to be like Voldemort. Nobody would speak its name out of fear that it lurked in waiting. But now? Now it's more popular than ever! Just look at this graph! Look! You can tell the popularity is really going up because of the helpful up arrows. They, you gotta put those there for people that don't know how to read graphs. Popularity has, is going up exponentially over um, but it's not just the teens with their jewel pods and rap bands. It's everyone on the entire left. Yeah, you heard me. According to Mr. D'Souza, the whole left is espousing leftist ideas. Now it is affirmed either explicitly or implicitly by just about everyone on the left. D D Did you hear that? They're advocating socialism both explicitly and implicitly. I don't know how one would advocate for something implicitly. Advocating for something seems to me to be a pretty explicit act. Don't know how they're doing that implicitly. Maybe they're just sitting around going, boy howdy, sure does seem to cause a lot of problems that the means of productions are owned privately. Huh? Huh? I'm not saying, you know, 
as you take them, but uh, not, not saying it. What is driving people to socialism? It's unclear. That part's not important. Don't worry about it. But what is clear is that nowadays, all these pinkos are talking about democratic socialism. And what does that mean? Well, take it away, Dinesh. Socialism, according to its proponents, is more democratic and therefore more moral than capitalism. Democratic socialism means everyone has a seat at the table and everybody gets a slice of the pie. We believe that the democracy in our political life should also be extended deeply into economic life. The basic idea here is that socialism is vindicated through its roots and popular consent. Now I'd like to look very closely at this sentence. The basic idea here is that socialism is vindicated through its roots and popular consent. Now, I'm not a professional writer like Dinesh is. I couldn't string two words together without making three spelling mistakes, let alone write not one, but two books that were taken off shelves. So maybe I'm missing something here. But this feels like a nonsense sentence. Like, for starters, vindicated? Vindicated from what? From the presumption that it's a bad and dangerous system? The only reason to vindicate something is to defend it from suspicion and doubt. I don't think that is the position that Irving Howe was trying to articulate. Through its roots in popular consent. What do you mean its roots? Do you mean through popular consent? Or something which at some point had popular consent, but now it does not. Something that is rooted in popular consent, but doesn't necessarily have it. Dinesh, my man, this is a bad sentence. You did it bad. See, how and more weren't arguing that socialism is good because people consent to it, or whatever garbage you're trying to say. They were arguing that if we agree that democracy is good, and most people do, then it follows that the extension of democracy into the economic sphere, i.e. socialism, would also be good. Dinesh actually agrees with this point, except for the i.e. socialism part. We'll get to that later, but he argues that capitalism is more economically democratic than socialism because of how his brain is bad. Given the context of the rest of this video, if I had to reverse engineer this sentence into one that made a look of sense, then I think he's trying to say, socialists think it is moral to make economic decisions by popular consent. But if he phrased it that way, his audience might say, wait, wait, doesn't everybody? So he can't do that. Can't do that. He's got to gussy that sentence up like it's going for a job interview. So what, if anything, does Dinesh D'Souza think democratic socialism even is? I pause here to note how I would define democratic socialism. Democratic socialism is essentially what most people mean when they just say socialist without having some modifier like libertarian or Maoist or national, because socialism by definition is democratic in the truest sense of the word. Under socialism, the means of production are socially controlled, in the case of democratic socialism, directly by the people rather than mediated through the state. Some democratic socialists might think that the state ought to exist, at least for a while, they're wrong, but they pointedly don't believe it should control production. They are in contrast to authoritarian socialists, who confusingly also believe, or at least claim to believe, that their system is democratic. Lenin called the centralization of control over the state and economy democratic centralism. North Korea's official name is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. But come on guys, come on, you're not tricking anybody. Those aren't like what Dem Socks advocate, they frame themselves directly as the antithesis to that kind of socialism. But that's what it actually is. What does Dinesh think it is? Simple. It's exactly like the system we have now, except every so often everybody gets together and votes on which billionaire to take the money away from. No, really, that's actually what he thinks it is. If a majority of people working through their elected representatives declare something to be a public entitlement, say free college or free health care, then they are justified in extracting resources from those who create wealth to pay for it. What if 51% of Americans vote to confiscate the resources of a single person, say Bill Gates? Does that make it right? Dinesh, that is not what democratic socialism means. But it does sound way cooler than what we have now. Like, if you thought socialists would be swayed away from their beliefs out of concern for Bill Gates's financial well-being, you guessed wrong. That's based as hell, my dude. This hypothetical is delicious to me. I want to eat it up. It'd be wrong for everybody to decide to take away Bill Gates's money and use it on useless shit like healthcare and schools. But it's perfectly fine for Bill Gates to personally have more money than entire countries. He created that wealth because he invented computer. 
Well, he didn't invent computers, someone else did that. And he didn't make computer, factory workers made computer. And he didn't write the software for computer because thousands of employees did that, and he didn't sell the software or ship it around, he had people to do that for him. No, he earned the money by owning the rights to the software, which he got because people who made the software had to agree to give him that to get paid. Now, they could have started their own software companies, I guess, but Microsoft had a virtual monopoly in home computers in the 90s. Also, if Microsoft wanted to crush your software company, all they'd have to do is make your software incompatible with Windows, or include a free version of your software with Windows, and you're fucking donezo. They did it all the time. That's how he created his wealth, by owning the stuff needed to make it. That's why he should get to keep that stuff, because it's the only way to create wealth. And it wouldn't be fair to take it away from him, because then, if you just gave it to everybody, everybody could create wealth, and that's bad, because it, um, the, uh, thing is, guys like Bill Gates don't create things to justify their billions. Bill Gates wrote some software in his time, sure, but when he was writing it, it wasn't making billions of dollars. Because no one person can make something so valuable that it is worth a billion dollars. They have to rely on the labor of others to do that. Even if Bill Gates personally wrote every line of code in every Microsoft product, even if he spent thousands of sleepless nights personally building each and every Xbox, the average computer coder makes roughly 90,000 US dollars a year, roughly. That's about $43 an hour, but let's say that Bill Gates has an amazing brain and his work is 10 times as good as the average computer programmer, so a fair price would be 430 US dollars an hour. And he's such a great employee that he works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because he doesn't need to eat, sleep, or go to the bathroom. That means he makes about $3,700,000 a year. So to earn $1 billion, he'd only have to work for 270 years. And he has a net worth of 133 billion US dollars, so that'd take him a paltry 35,910 years. There's nobody alive anywhere on the planet, nor has there ever been or ever will be, a single human being that does 30,000 years worth of another human being's labor. I should hope that's obvious. It is absurd on its face. It is a, it is a, absurd amount of money. It's like a Willy Wonka Dr. Seuss amount of money. It's, it's a fun concept to think about, but it, it shouldn't, no one should have that much. It's not an issue of Bill Gates having a bigger TV or nicer shoes. It's that he has two Serbias and one Estonia's worth of money, with some change. Meanwhile, thousands of people live in poverty and squalor, and we could care for all of them if we reduced Bill Gates' personal fortune to a smaller, but still absurd amount of money, like, say, one billion dollars. We wouldn't even need to make him live like the rest of us. We could leave him with enough that he could never, ever in his life expect to spend it. There's no functional difference in the day-to-day -day lifestyle of a person with a billion dollars and someone with a hundred billion dollars or someone with infinity dollars. It's purely vanity to allow him to earn more and hoard more at this point. And what kind of a moral coward do you have to be to look at this situation and conclude that the crime of stealing from one person, but leaving them enough that they'll never have to lift a finger ever again and could buy literally anything they could ever want, is worse than allowing millions of people to starve. But even that is not really fair, because it wouldn't be stealing, would it? He's the one that stole that money in the first place. By rights, it belongs to everyone. He could pay back the thousands of of employees that did the work that made him rich, that alone would probably bankrupt him, at the very least make him live within the means that most of us do. But Bill Gates will never pay down the debt of living in the world, having roads to drive on, water to drink, the breadth of knowledge and technology around him that's the product of thousands of thinkers and builders doing that hard work for him. He can't pay back Copernicus, or Pythagoras, or Ibn Sina, or Confucius, or Plato. He can't pay back computer pioneers like Ada Lovelace, or Alan Turing. He can't pay back the guy that mined the aluminum, the guy that smelted it, or the guy that shipped it to the factory where he was able to print Windows 95 CDs on it. All belongs to all. You can't disentangle one bit of labor from the economy. It's everybody's contributing to everything.
The lengths that D'Souza has to go to to make this seem like a bad thing are pretty funny. Under an authoritarian socialist government, a single dictator seizes the fruits of your labor. Everyone is against that. Under democratic socialism, a majority does. The end result is the same. You've been robbed. Dinesh, you little baby, you absolute infant. If most people are robbing you, that means that for most people, the result is that they get more money. They're not stealing all of Bill Gates' money and then putting it into a big pile and lighting it on fire like Joe Clown from Sir Gawain and the Dark Knight. They're taking it so that they can have more of the money. Just think about the words that you say out loud for everyone to hear. I don't know what kind of robbery Dinesh is referring to here, though. It's not like everybody is voting for a burglar to break into Bill Gates' money bin. He's either talking about taxing Gates or straight up reappropriating his property. In either case, Gates is not left poor. It's not like you can tax someone more than the amount of money they make. So no matter the tax burden, Gates would be coming out ahead. Just less ahead than he might have if the tax burden were lesser. In terms of reappropriation, well, Gates still has the option to be a worker in his confiscated property, just like everyone else. He has the option of living the same life that is aspirational to the people proposing it. But all of this is academic, because what he's describing has nothing to do with what democratic socialists want, and pretty much nothing to do with where D'Souza's arguments are going to end up. You see, socialism isn't democratic because people can't control governments. While under capitalism, people vote with their dollars. So if you, if you think about it, the market is the real economic democracy. And at this point, I just, I just want to remind you that I'm responding to a five minute video. You probably didn't believe me when I said it contained as much bullshit as the equivalent of a 25 minute video from anyone else, did you? But here we are. What direct control do the people really have over any government institution? The answer, of course, is none. Given its practical impossibility, genuine popular control over government institutions is a mirage. I agree that people typically have little control over the operations of a government in a representative democracy. But it still might have been good if Dinesh had demonstrated that or explained what he meant by it. He just kind of says, hey, look, it's impossible, okay? Nobody can be involved in every decision the government makes, duh, moving on. Which is true, I guess, and that would seem to be a knock against socialism if one assumed that it required representative democracy. But we don't! People often argue that direct democracy is impossible in government or governance. Because there are just too many things to do for everyone to have a say in everything. You want to spend your whole day voting? Okay. But nobody cares about having a say in literally everything. People care about having a say in the things that matter to them. How about this? Everybody has the right to vote on any decision that the government makes that they do not have to exercise if they don't feel like it. If you have strong feelings about where the new water treatment plant should be built, you vote. Otherwise, you let the people who care decide. Maybe the day-to-day -day operations run automatically unless someone submits a motion to change them, and then that motion passes a majority vote. Ever think of that? Genius? Because socialists did. It's how socialist labor unions have operated for literal centuries. Each of us are not only citizens, we are also consumers. The consumer, like the citizen, is a voter. As citizens, we vote once every two or four years. As consumers, we vote many times a day. Only a fraction of citizens are eligible to vote at the ballot box, but every consumer votes in the marketplace, even felons. But at last, we come to see the meat of his argument, yum, yum, yum. You see, capitalism is more democratic because you could... Yum, 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 what was... You see, capitalism is more democratic because you can choose what products to buy. Being a consumer and a citizen, pretty much the same thing, and he says that, like it's not horrifying. Except a citizen only votes every two to four years, while a consumer votes dozens of times a day when choosing which products to buy. If you prefer an Audi to a Lexus or the Apple iPhone to the Samsung Galaxy, you don't have to elect some other guy to exercise these preferences. You do it directly yourself. Yeah, there's an example that'll help us work and folk understand whether you prefer an Audi or a Lexus, because capitalism offers you both choices. You know what's weird though? You know what's weird is I can't seem to afford an Audi or a Lexus. In a democracy, you vote for the thing that you want 
there are no options that some voters can vote for and some voters cannot. Imagine a democracy where you're given a certain amount of voting points so that you couldn't necessarily vote on the things that you want, but only on the things that you could afford with your voting points. And if you wanted to vote for something else, you'd have to convince someone to give you some of their voting points. Imagine that some voters have billions of voting points and some have none, and some still have less than none because they owe thousands of voting points to someone else like a credit card company or a student loan company or payday loan company. Everybody wants to vote for the Honey Nut Cheerios party, but they can only afford to vote for the Kirkland Honey Nut Oatos party. And their dad is like, it's the same thing, the party's made of the same ingredients but the proportion of the ingredients could still be different, Dad, and you can taste the difference. Like, if you try it, you can taste the difference. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Well, that's what D'Souza is proposing is the best and most democratic system possible. He claims that this represents a direct democracy. Moreover, citizens participate in a system of representative democracy. Their views are filtered through the politicians who represent them. Consumers, by contrast, vote in a system of direct democracy. But does it? I can buy an iPhone, but I can't use my money to vote that Apple make an iPhone with a removable battery. I have to buy the one with the battery soldered in, so that if the battery dies, I have to replace the whole unit. I can't vote with my money to get them to put the 16mm headphone jack back in. I buy the ones they make, or I buy something else. I can't use my money to get them to improve labor conditions in their factories, I can just buy an iPhone if I want or not buy one. You could apply pressure to Apple to make those changes by not buying their products and by buying a competitor's, the same way that you could apply pressure to a political party to adopt the policies you like by withholding your vote. You could make your own phone, I mean, not really, but in theory you could, the same way that you could make your own political party. Doesn't that more closely resemble representative democracy than direct democracy? You can buy the product that is available, that most closely meets your needs, but not dictate how the product is designed directly. He goes on to say that capitalism doesn't rely on exploitation, but rather has to give people what they want. Free markets work not through greed or exploitation, but by satisfying our wants. Which is obviously untrue, right? Capitalists don't have to give people what they want, they have to give people what they expect they can make money from. Do you think minimum wage workers want to scrub toilets? Do you think people want to buy an adapter for the proprietary plug that only Apple uses? Jesus Christ, fuck you Apple, why do you keep doing this? Do you think people enjoy paying rent or auto insurance? Do you think the third world slave labor used to mine the cobalt in your electronics wake up every day whistling a jaunty tune and have a spring in their step, eager to get to work on their true passion, destroying their body and hard labor so some dude in another country they'll never even meet can can get a second yacht? Is, is that what you think? Do you think it's all just consumer choice? There are plenty of consumer goods which people want, but companies, for whatever reason, refuse to provide. You'll never get to play Mother 3 in English legally, even though it's already been translated because Nintendo just straight up doesn't want, doesn't think they get enough of money. They'll never bring back orbits, no matter how much I would pay, which is infinite money. I would pay anything for one fresh Orbitz. The fake juice from the 90s with bits of sludge floating in it. It's a Canadian thing. I want one so badly. Capitalism isn't exploitative because it forces people to buy products they don't want. Nobody is saying that. It's exploitative because of the way those products are produced, i.e. some dickhead owns the means of production and thereby gets to dictate what is made and why. They pay some people a little bit of money and then pocket the difference between the profit that those people generate and the wage that they are paid. You certainly have choices under capitalism. You can choose which of the 10,000 brands of toothpaste you want to use, but you don't get a choice of how toothpaste factories are run, how toothpaste is marketed, or what chemical additives are in it. Not unless you have the money to run your own toothpaste company, and you don't. You don't have that. Admit it. Choice for some and not for others is not democracy. Just like it's undemocratic to withhold the vote from women or BIPOC or BIPOC, I don't know, I don't know how to say it out loud, or felons, Dinesh, it is likewise undemocratic to remove agency from how the economy operates to the poor, giving the lion's share of the votes to a small group of people and leaving others completely unrepresented. There's a word for that, and it's not democracy. It's oligarchy. Well, hello everybody, and welcome on down to the Solidarity Corner. 
This cozy little slice of YouTube is where I offer solidarity to small leftist projects. Now some of you seem confused in the comment section, so let me clear something up right now. There was never an eyeball. Where am I? What is this? Why am I here? Please let me go, please. Well, hello everybody and welcome on down to the Solidarity Corner. Hey, since you're here, you probably like videos of people dunking on Dinesh D'Souza. Well, guess what, creeps? My pal Tristan did that a couple times. Check those out. Speaking of video games, I have two video game related video essays for you this week. Essay the first, The Sims 2000 as Anti-Capitalist Critique by, and he told me I could pronounce his name however I want, I guess I never really picked up on the satirical take on consumerism in The Sims, but in my defense, I haven't played it since high school. Outlines the ways that the game mocks consumer culture, but also how it kind of fails to mock consumer culture. Lots to think about. Essay the second is Forced Labor, Funko Pops, and The Last of Us Part Two by Always Bet On Dunk. This is a real funny video that goes into how video games are product first and art second and how that inevitably neuters the end product and creates toxic work environments where people's passion for game development is exploited to shit out a disposable product, not unlike a Funko Pop. Check out that video! You can find links to all the videos in the description. Do you have a small project you've been having trouble getting out there for the world to see? Don't worry, I can help a little bit. Send me an email over at thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word somewhere in the subject line, and maybe you'll find yourself chilling with me here in the Solidarity Corner. Beep boop, it's me, the algorithm. I just wanted to remind you that if you want this video to, uh, to do good, you gotta, you gotta press the like button and subscribe to the channel for, for this guy's sake. Just kidding, it's not the algorithm, it's me. I did a flawless impression. Hey, you want more videos? Fine, uh, you can go to Scaredy Cats, which is my horror channel about horror media, over at youtube.com slash scaredycatstv. Just did a video about uh, a very disturbing short film from the director of Midsommar that you probably shouldn't watch. Do you want to take some money away from Bill Gates and give it to me? You can give it to me over at patreon.com slash thoughtsline. That's, if you look at these drawings, that's how come they're there. I made those because of, of patrons is why. But also if you will want to watch a live stream, then you can check me out every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over at twitch.tv slash thoughtslime, but also here at youtube.com slash thoughtslime. Wow, lot of options. Did you know that Dinesh D'Souza is a piece of garbage? Did you know that? Probably. Okay, fuck everything, goodbye.